is Pastor Lauder Milton from the Cross Church. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about our services and our service time and invite you to come and worship with us. We have many wonderful programs in place that would be a blessing to your family, our children's program, our teenage program, and, and the Bible studies and the church services that are geared for each member of your family. Way of the Cross Church is located at 612 Beatrice Drive in Riverside, Ohio. Riverside is a small community between Dayton and Huber Heights. Beatrice Drive is a connector street between Brant Pike and Harshman Road. The church is located again at 612 Beatrice Drive. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., of course, our main service. We have service on Sunday evening at 6.30 and then our midweek Bible study for adults and teenagers and children of all ages is on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. I sincerely invite you to come and be part of these services, and God bless you as uh, you watch the program this evening. Well, this morning is Communion Sunday, but I want to say a few things about, um, uh, about the worship that we've talked about this morning. Uh, it was a, several years ago that Miss Fayreen came up with this concept of church on fire and said, you know, what a good idea if we just all symbolize that by wearing red. And, um, and, and many of you remembered that. Some of you didn't remember it, but that's okay because being on fire for God doesn't have anything to do with the color of your clothes. I didn't you want to get a picture? Well, you go ahead and get a picture then. Everybody stand up. <laughs> uh, Billy wants to put you on. You want me to face you? Okay, we can do that. But, you know, as I was saying, as I was saying, being on fire for the Lord, that doesn't have anything to do with the color of our clothes. But, you know, it's a good symbol, especially in January and February. You got <laughs> I, I, I'm, liking, I'm liking Billy's Ohio State red jersey myself, you know. But, but then I looked, I, I want somebody to look at Jack Duty's red attire. I want, I, want to look, I want somebody to look at Jack. Jack is, in the words of my old Texas buddy, he is suave, deboner, and nonchalant this morning. I told a young fellow he's looking suave, the boner, nonchalant, and he looked at me like I was speaking in tongues or something. He, didn't, he had no idea what I was saying. <laughs> Suave, debonair, yes. and nonchalant. <laughs> uh, anyway, the idea that it's a cold time of the year when, uh, you know, you can feel a little fire in your bones. Now, obviously, church on fire is a metaphorical, is a metaphorical. Uh, Baptist had to say, he said, I baptize you with water. But the one who's coming after me, thank you, Becky, is mightier than I, whose shoestrings I'm not even worthy to bend down and unloose, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Yeah. Billy was singing that, Oh, Lord, let the uh, power, this, how, how is it going? Let's sing. Oh, Lord, send the fire just now and baptize everyone. Well, you know, that's one of those famous examples of my famous repertoire. Of, there's verses to that, that song, you know. One of, the, one of the verses, I can, I can barely remember this. I bet Brenda knows it. It says, they were in an upper chamber. They were all in one accord. When the Holy Ghost descended, as was promised by the Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord, send the power just now. Amen? So anyway, this idea of just, you know, just being a church on fire for Jesus is a good idea. We all get cold and, uh, you know, weak and worn in our faith at times. Jeremiah did. Jeremiah said, if I say I will not mention him or speak in his name, 
but his word is like fire shut up in my bones. So even though Jeremiah got weary of preaching and nobody listening, you know, he just had to keep on preaching because it was like uh, the fire of the Lord was on his house. So I talked to you last week a few things about what I thought the fire of uh, a church on fire would look like. And uh, I'd like to just finish that thought this week, if I could, for a few minutes. First of all, uh, Debbie, you're going to help me with the overhead this morning, I'm thinking, okay. Uh, First of all, let me tell you that a church on fire is a repenting church. A repenting church. You all know what repent means? Now, repent means, oh Lord, I'm sorry that I got caught from my sins. Doesn't that know what repent means? No. To repent is, Lord, I'm tired of going my way. I'm going to turn around and go your way. You know, it's not, I mean, we are all sorry for the consequences of our sins. But the person who changes the way they do things, that's repenting. You know, and, and you know what, this is what Jesus said. He said, if you don't repent, you'll all perish. So I want to be a repenting Christian, don't you? I do. The Bible says, you know, uh, John, who was the disciple that Jesus seemed to, well, he said he was the disciple Jesus loved the most. (laughs) He felt that way. Jesus would say, well, I'm glad you felt that way, son, but I loved all of you. But John said, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. Jesus is faithful and just. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A Christian that is on fire will be a Christian who understands the importance of repenting. Now, if you want to know more about Revelation 2 and 3, you ought to come to Pastor Dave's Wednesday night class. And you'll hear him tell you about about the seven churches of Asia. But in Revelation chapter 2, there's a church at Ephesus that Jesus said, I've got, now, now, now the way we understand these churches, they were seven literal churches. They, They represent seven flaws or five flaws and two strengths that can be found in different Christians. Or they very possibly could represent seven successive periods of church history which would be characterized by the flaws or the virtues as mentioned in each of these seven churches. But the first one in Ephesus, he said, I have some, something against you because you've left your first love. He said, repent. This is what he said in chapter 2. He said, I know your works and I, and I know your labors. And you've labored for my name's sake. But verse 4, he said, I have this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do your first works. Repent. So let me look at me a minute. A church or a Christian that wants to be on fire has to confess and repent of their sins and be like, when Jesus said, he said to, the, to that lady, Jesus treated her like a lady. He said to that lady, he said, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. See, a church on fire is a repentant church. Why don't you lift your hands with me and say, Lord, I want to have a repentant heart. You know, God will give you a spirit of repentance. If you ask the Holy Spirit to be your moral guide, your moral compass, and you entreat the Holy Spirit to give you a repentant heart, I don't want a rebellious heart. I want to be, I want, if I transgress, no, when I transgress, when I transgress, I want the Holy Spirit to smite my heart that moment. I want to have a repentant heart. And a church on fire, a Christian on fire, is a 
Christian who wants to walk, wants to do the things that God wants him to. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Don't you want to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Lord, I want to keep your commandments. I told you last week one of the greatest evidences of the Holy Spirit in your life is love. And first of all, love for God, then love for others. Oh, hallelujah. So, I would say to you that one of the chief components or characteristics of a church on fire is a church that repents quickly and easily of their disobedience. And to repent is not to, remember that, it's not just to be sorry for your, the consequences of your sin or sorry that you got caught. I, there's a lot of people that pray when they get caught. But to repent is to have a heart like God that pants after God, hungers after God. Won't you ask God to give you that kind of heart? If you ask him to, he will. If you are sincere and you ask God to give you a repentant heart, God will help you to have a repentant heart. Amen. The second thing I would say about a... a, a well, anyway, the, the, all seven of those churches... Well, of those seven churches, five of them had to, were called upon to repent. One of them for being a dead church. One of them for being a lukewarm church. One of them for being a conforming church to the world system, and one of them for being a corrupt church. There were only two of those churches that he commended. One of them was going through persecution, so going through the fire of tribulation. Now, being on fire for God does not mean that you will not have persecution. It doesn't mean that you will not have trouble. There's only one way out of this world, and that's through trouble. <laughs> but be of good cheer. He's overcome the world. Okay, so a repentant church. I could take more time with that, but I, I want to I say all this to you. Boy, that'll take some doing, won't it? <laughs> to say all I got to say. Oh, my goodness, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. <laughs> the second thing I say a church is, is Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, repent. And if you do, Acts chapter 3, verse 19 says, If you do repent, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. A church on fire is a refreshing church. It's a repentant church, but it's a church where people... It's a terrible thing to go to church and leave feeling worse than you did when you come. A church on fire is a church where people feel the refreshing presence of God. It says, that's what it says. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you understand that he said that when any two or three of you would gather together in his name, or uh, in this case, there were 120 of them gathered together, and they were all in one mind and one accord. Hallelujah. Do you understand that Jesus is in the midst of his disciples when they are in unity? And if he's there, if he's present, Times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. When the Lord walks in the room, I get refreshed. Hallelujah. It's like water from the well at Bethlehem. When the Lord walks in the room, there is a refreshing spirit in my life that lifts me higher than the troubles and the trials. Hallelujah. And when God's people 
worship together. That's where the anointing is at. When we are in one mind and one accord. That doesn't mean we all wear red. Doesn't mean we all look alike. Doesn't mean we all talk alike. Doesn't, you know, it means where? That Jesus is the focus of your life, and you're there because you love him and you love the brethren or the cistern, whatever the case may be. Cistern is not a word. Cistern is what you, never mind, never mind. I just see if you're awake. So repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of of the Lord. I read in Psalm 16 verse 11, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Hallelujah. When we leave church, that's the way we should feel. In the King James Version, of Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it, said, it was said of the disciples that the people that were, were questioning them, it says they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And when we leave this place, it ought to be obvious. When we leave each other's presence, it ought to be obvious that we've been with Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. So it ought to be a, a refreshing church. I, and, and last night, uh, my brother called me and woke me up last night. Uh, and, and as I listened to him talk, you know, something just came to my heart. I just, and I, I wrote it down. I was thankful that he called me. Um, a church on fire ought to be a resuscitating church. Now, I don't know if I can find a scripture for that or not. That word resuscitate is probably not in the Bible. But you know what it means? To resuscitate is to bring somebody back from the dead. There's, there's a couple stories. There's a story over in, in the book of Kings where the Elisha, Remember that story where the, widow, where, the, where the woman had a son? She wasn't a widow, but the woman had a son. And that, that son died. And she sent for Elisha. And she was such a good woman. She had been such a servant of God. And that, you know, it tells us that Elisha stretched himself out on that dead boy. Face to face. You know, just, and, and nothing happened. And he got up again and he walked around and he prayed and he went back and he, did it again, and all of a sudden that boy came back to life. Now, that's a strange story, I understand. <coughs> I understand that. But in a very real way, you and I, do you know we were dead in our trespasses and sins and God breathed into us the, uh, the breath, of, breath of life? Just like he breathed into Adam. Adam was just an inanimate object and God breathed in him. Do you understand that the Bible says that that Jesus breathed on the disciples and he said, receive you the Holy Spirit. And it was as good as done. <coughs> you and I, excuse me, you and I ought to be able to breathe out and be a blessing. Now, you say, how's that done? A few years ago, 25 years ago, I went to visit a preacher. That I wanted to see the church that he had passed, that he had been had led in building a building. I went to see that church, and while he was taking me on a tour of that church, he fell on the ground with a heart attack. And, and I, I, I knew nothing about mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, just, you know, a little bit, but I tried to. I breathed into him. With every, I breathed, and it must have, been, oh, must have been 10 minutes before the squad got there. His wife was just panicked and, and, you know, going to pieces, and she'd run and call for the ambulance, and and I was breathing into him. And they came and they took him to the hospital. And, and, and to my great regret, you know, that minister, you know, that he didn't survive that. He, 
It was time for him to go. And so I wasn't regretful for that. I knew where he was at. But I mean, I wanted to keep him alive. You've got to want to keep people alive. You've got to want to be a church. You know, it says in Acts chapter 9 that Saul went to arrest Christians breathing out threatenings and slaughter. You can breathe out hate. You can breathe out judgment. You can breathe out all those bad things or you can breathe out the love of God. Because that's what God's word is. It's his breath. I read Paul's instruction where he said in Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration and profitable. All scripture by inspiration. When I was in Bible college, they told me, they told me, they taught me how to read a Greek dictionary. I can't speak Greek. It's all Greek to me, but I can read a dictionary. And I understand that the word for inspiration, the Greek word, because the New Testament was written in Greek, Paul wrote in Greek. I understand that the word for the scripture, word for inspiration, is the word theo. It's actually a compound word. It's two words together. Theo, which is the Greek word for God, theology. Theo, neutosis which is the word for, it's in our English language as the word pneumatic or pneumonia or pneumatologist. It simply means breath. The word of God is God breathed. We can breathe out threatenings and murder or we can breathe out the word of God. And if we breathe out the word of God, if the word of God is breathed out, the word of God has power to help people live. You understand? Yes, even physically, but more important than living physically, though I did not save my friend's life. When I went to the hospital, I followed him to the hospital. They pronounced him dead. I did not save his life, but he's alive. Because the word of God makes alive. And a church on fire ought to be a resuscitating church, bringing people to life in Christ. Amen. Why don't you give the Lord praise this morning for his glory? Amen. Now, I, I've got to get done. I, I, I've got to quit because we want to bring these children in here this morning. I thought it was so important to let them be part of our communion service. I just want to say this, a church on fire, a church on fire is a reverent church. A church on fire is a reverent church. The definition of reverent is deeply, deeply respectful. There are many things that the Bible tells us that we should have reverence for we should have reverence for God's name. In Psalms 111, verse 9, I think, King James Version, I believe it says, God himself says, my name is reverent. Isn't, is that what it says? Uh, Psalms 111, verse 9, I think. I don't know, along, somewhere in history, we ministers co-opted God's name, and we call ourselves reverend so-and-so, reverend so-and-so. A few years ago, I felt condemned over that. I took that off my check. You know, I couldn't, when I was younger, I couldn't wait to put that title on my checks. Reverend Laudermilk. Somehow it garnered some respect or something, I guess. I don't know, but 10 years or 15 years or so ago, I thought, you know what? I don't feel all that reverent. God is reverend. And I just did just William and Charlotte Laudermilk now. But we ought to reverence the name of God. And so many times we carelessly show irreverence to the name of God. It would do well, we would do well to remember that when those scribes, trans, when, they, when they transmitted the scriptures to us from one generation to another, they had to do it by hand. They had to write the scriptures out by hand because we, we've only had a printing press since back in the, 
what, the 15, late 1500s? So we had a lot of history before then, and the way they transmitted the scriptures to us, they wrote it out by hand. But every time they come to the name of God, so important to honor the name of God, they would tell you the traditions. They would rise and they would, they would wash their hands. They would, if their garments were stained, they would change their garments. In the Old Testament, the name of God was so holy that, you didn't, that, that, the, that the name of God was so holy that they had to develop synonyms for his name because they would not speak his name. It was so holy. It says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It would be good for us to teach our young people to not use God or Jesus as a byword. That would be good to do that. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm new to Facebook. I love Facebook. I'm just goofing off on Facebook. You know, I, I mean, I, I know it's kind of stupid. I understand that to be doing what I'm doing. I, I, it's kind of silly, you know. But I'm having a good time. So, you know, so I, I run it. But, but I see people, I figured out the code. They have, they have codes on Facebook, and they have this OMG. Which just means, oh, my God. That's the wrong way to use God's name. God's name ought to be used in adoration and love and reverence and respect. Don't let the profane age we live in draw you into its spider web. Honor the Lord thy God with your words, your mouth. Honor the Lord your God with your entire life. Honor the Lord your God. Put him first. Let him be the high and the holy and the lifted up one in your life. Honor him. Honor his name. Honor his word. Honor his church. He said, this is what he said. He said, have reverence for my sanctuary. That's over in the book of Leviticus. When you come into God's house, oh, I understand God's house is your heart. But I also understand that there are places that are devoted to his honor. And in his house, you should reverence him. You should reverence his house. I'm not going to say any more about that, except to say that it's not your house. You wouldn't want somebody coming to your house and treating your house however they wanted to treat it. You would want them to honor the fact that it's not their house. God's house is God's house. We should, with all of our soul, mind, and strength, seek to honor, to reverence His sanctuary. We should reverence His scriptures. Somebody, I used to think, when I was a young man, I thought I reverenced the scriptures because I wouldn't put another book on top of it. I remember when I was in the army, I had a Bible that my mother gave me when I left to go to the army. And there was even a note in that Bible from my mother that I didn't read until after I got out of the army. Because I didn't read the Bible. But I had it in my footlocker. In those days, you could have, you know, you, you, had foot, you stood footlocker inspection. My, and you could have a Bible. I had my Bible in my footlocker in its prescribed place because there was a place for everything in your footlocker. You didn't just throw things in your footlocker. I don't know what they do now, but I'm talking about the brown boot army. <laughs> you didn't just throw things in your footlocker. Your footlocker was inspected. I'd go to my footlocker, I'd open my footlocker, I'd go to chow because you had to put your, chow, your, you had to put your hat somewhere because you didn't wear your hat inside the building. So I'd throw my hat into my footlocker. I'd start down the steps to, to the mess hall and something would say to me, did you put your hat on top of the Bible? And I couldn't go any farther. I'd turn around, I'd go back, and I'd check. Yeah, my hat, I'd take the hat off and look because I didn't want to put anything. I thought I was respecting the Bible. That wasn't respecting the Bible. That was superstition. When you reverence the Bible, you read it. When you reverence the Bible, when you reverence God's Word, God's Word that men have given their life for, God's word is written in blood. When you reverence the Bible, 
You don't let it lay on your coffee table for weeks on end without the dust being dusted off of it. When you reverence God's Word, you read God's Word. And a church on fire is a reverent church. I'm going on vacation, so I'm getting everything off my chest. <laughs> I'll move on. Because it's, it is time to move on. Girls, come down. Let's get ready for communion. <laughs> a church on fire. I, these are notes that I made while they're coming. I'll slip them in. A church on fire is a reverent church. And I'll tell you something else. A church on fire is a church that's committed to reconciliation between people. You understand that? I want to tell you, we live, we live in a time, we live in a key strategic time where we Christians, look at me, look at me, look at me. We live in a time where we Christians can demonstrate the world to the world what it means to have brotherly love. If there is any place in this world where people are going to be reconciled, do you understand that God makes no distinctions between people? That all nations, peoples, kindreds, and tongues are of equal importance to Almighty God? Do you know that the first person that ever come to Christ outside of Judaism was a man from Africa? Did you know that? Did you know that the first person who ever came to Christ in Europe wasn't a man, it was a woman? Isn't that amazing? Because the Word of God reconciles people to one another. And the church of Jesus Christ should be able to model that. We should love one another. We should respect one another. We should value and highly esteem one another. We should treat every man, every woman, every boy, every girl as a person for whom Jesus Christ shed his life's blood for. That's right. I got to thinking about people coming and immigrating, coming here to this country. I got to thinking about, you know, we're going to, you know, because, you know, you, you get caught up in the hyperbole about the, you know, the, you know, the, all the tension that's in the Middle East between, you know, Christians and Muslims. And I got to thinking how hard it is to send a Christian missionary to a Muslim country. It's very hard. Can't do that. So maybe God's just sending some Muslims here that I can be a missionary right here at home. I have a neighbor who's, I, I'm not sure, quite sure, I, I think, I mean, it's a form, it's a, it's a Hindu religion. Now please understand, I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. But how am I going to make somebody who wasn't raised that way believe that? By me telling him? By me pointing my finger in his face? No. I'm going to do it by being good to him. By showing some love and some friendship to him. That's the way I'm going to do it. I saw my, I saw my Hindu neighbor the other day. He's been sick. And I said to him, I said, can I pray for you? And he said, yes. I put my hand on his shoulder. And I called him by name. And I prayed and I asked Jesus to touch him and heal him and give him healing strength. And I'm believing Jesus is going to do that. Does that make sense? So a church on fire is a church that respects people. Now, I have to speak the truth. I have to say what I believe about everything that, that the Bible teaches me to say that about. But I have to do it in a way that people know that I value them for being a person. And trust the Holy Spirit to let the words be real to them. Amen? Amen. All right.